All right, thank you everyone. As we know, um, technology can be a bear. Um, Dr. Hill did that this morning and talked about it and it's always great when it works, but when it doesn't, we have to just regroup. So here we go. We're here with Cheryl Hoey. Um, she is doing babies and brains. We are super excited to have her today. She has also been on our podcast and as a, a and she's just amazing. So you're going to like her presentation a lot. She is the owner of the Easy Ed To Go, an early childhood consulting agency, and is the current program director of the early childhood education at Fisher College in Boston. Cheryl has also worked at the University of Virginia at the National Center for Research on Early Childhood Education as a research scientist in the pilot study of the class, the National Center for Children in Poverty, Columbia University, Mailman School of Public Health, Research Connections, and as a research description writer, and is a CDA professional development specialist. Cheryl is dedicated to providing current knowledge, research, and theories in early childhood. Cheryl, thank you so much for being at the conference today, and thank you, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much for having me, and you would think after that wonderful introduction, I could figure out how to share my PowerPoint. But, um, so the main uh, aspect I get today is that I hope you will, I know when people hear brain development, they kind of shy away or they think it's going to be boring and especially at I'm on East Coast time. So it's about quarter of five. So um, I believe it's around quarter of two for most of you. Um, so I hope to uh, keep you awake and I um, enjoyed the keynote speaker. 5 p.m. there. All right. So we're we're about the you know, I'm going to I'm going to have to kick it up a notch to keep you guys awake, but I hope to put a spin on brain development so that it um, interests you, so that you further uh, research it some more, ask me questions um, or email me. On the first slide, um, you will have my um, contact information and I can absolutely put it in the, um, in the chat box for you as well. So I can type that in. So there is my personal email and my website is, and I'm on Facebook under the same, um, same information, easy ed to go. Okay. All right. So thank you all for coming to this presentation. Can you all see the first slide? It should say basically just a title slide. We actually can't. We need to get that moved. It is completely black. Okay, so I am seeing the same thing. Okay, just making sure. Let's try, how about now? All right, um, that is a slide, but it's further down. So if you can go back a couple of slides. Let's see. The first slide should just say brainstem. The actual PowerPoint is still downloading. So I am unfortunately just using, here, let's try this. Let's, yeah, see it's so. Okay, well, I'll start and then when I, um, I'll know that I have the slides numbered, so I'll be able to, we'll make it work. Okay, we are at the very beginning and let's try from here. Oh, there okay. we are. Okay, next that okay? slide. Yep, okay. that is my, yep, that's my info. There we go, all right, perfect. So when we think of the brain, I want you to think of, and believe me, there's no way we could ever do the full brain in, in one hour, right? So I'm giving you little bits of pieces of some important information that I feel is pertinent to early childhood providers. And the first, if you think of it is, I want you to remember 424. So there's four parts of the brain, there's two lobes, and then there's four hemispheres, okay? So the first part of the brain that starts to develop is the brain stem. And the brainstem is responsible for things that you don't have to think about, things that just happen naturally, right? So basic survival functions, it's breathing, heartbeat, nor maintaining normal body temperature, your digestive process, elimination. It's basic functions that occur automatically without having to think of them. So when um, an infant is born, it's your their reflexes. So when something's coming to their eyes, they'll blink, um, and 
the reflexes, uh, sucking, rooting, grasping, those are all survival functions for an infant. And these are things that you don't really have to think about, right? The only time you have to try to think about them is if you want to try to moderate them. So if you want to, you know, you might be worked out or you did some exercising and you want to try to slow down your heart rate, that's when you have to kind of think, give it some consideration. Okay. Now, the second part of the brain to develop, next slide, please. is the cerebellum. This is actually located outside of the brain, and this is responsible and controls your balance, your movement, and coordination. So this is important for children when initiating and timing movements. It's important for balance, for posture, for coordinating um, how muscles work together, and it also helps regulate the force and the steadiness and the range of your move movements. So on with younger children, you'll notice when they start to enter kindergarten in some states or some places, they'll give them kind of a physical assessment, hop on one foot, you know, roll a ball, kick a ball. This all comes from that cerebellum part of the brain. Okay. And this develops, this allows a baby to go, an infant to go from say rolling over to then crawling, to then walking, to then running. So the cerebellum if you think of it as it's basically your balance, movement, and coordination. Okay, next slide, please. So the third part, probably one of my favorite parts, is the limbic system. Okay, the limbic system is actually inside of the brain, and it's the third part of the brain to begin to develop, and it's primarily responsible for processing emotions. Okay, next slide, please. So there's actually two parts of the limbic system, okay? It's the amygdala and the hippocampus. So the amygdala is the part of the brain that it's located within the limbic system and it registers emotion, emotions such as fear and anxiety, right? So if you think of things that, you know, if you take a minute and think of things that what are some things that, and you can type them in the chat box, what are some things that kind of gets your, uh, your blood running, kind of raises your pulse a little bit? What are some things? Common one is snakes. I get that a lot. What are some other things? <laughs> Tech issues, true. Bugs, bug phobia, height, thunder. My dog would agree with that. I have a 150 pound dog that gets, get some calming drops around fireworks and thunder and lightning, scary movies, water you can't see the bottom of, bridges is a common one as well too. Um, for some people it's train tracks. So this is where in the amygdala, this is where that fear and anxiety, some experience happened and it's formed a memory. So it's in that part of your brain that this is housed. This is that fight or flight, that fear and anxiety. It's housed in this amygdala part of the limbic system, right? Because that's an emotion. So it's processing is unconscious. So for an infant, it can process fear and anxiety even if the baby's not old enough to be conscious of those feelings, right? So many years ago, there was some advertising that was out there and it was about, um, you know, some domestic abuse situations where, you know, the father was like, you know, the, the dad was like screaming and yelling and the, and the mom was, you know, don't scream and yell, the baby will hear you. And they said, oh, it's just a baby, it won't hear me. And it was basically showing you is that even at that young age, we know that the child even subconsciously is registering and processing that emotion of fear and anxiety, right? So if the amygdala is damaged, whether accidental or um, in utero, a person might actually lose the ability to register fear or the opposite become overly fearful, right? So, when you think of, you know, the child that um, 
takes risks. You know, they're at the top of the slide and they're standing up and you're like, you know, feet first and on your bottom or, you know, the child that is overly fearful and won't even climb up the steps to get to the slide. So now I'm not saying to run back and, you know, diagnose children, but this could be the part of the brain that's been impacted for them initially. And they might need some, you know, some therapeutic um, specialist to come in to help work them through that because we want them to be cognizant of their, um, you, you naturally want them to have a little bit of fear because it, children need that fear because it, it is a protective mechanism as well. Next slide, please. So, oop, I'm sorry. All right, so we're gonna stay here, but I'll go back to, so the hippocampus is the second part of the limbic system. And the hippocampus is the emotional memory processor of the brain. So the emotional memories coded in the hippocampus are largely unconscious. And it actually, it's named after a Latin word for seahorse. Um, I, don't, I don't see that, no pun intended, but it resembles the shape of a seahorse. So the hippocampus does three things. It processes emotional information to form memories. It coordinates those memories. You need three things to coordinate those memories. I'm gonna ask you right now to think of a memory that comes to mind, right? And, you know, a happy memory because we're, we're at an early childhood conference it's August, it's the summer, it's warm. I love the warm weather. And we're gonna, we're gonna think of a happy memory. So if somebody wants to type in the, in the chat box, a happy memory that they've had, or they wanna share. Whether it be a wedding, a birth of a child, birth of a grandchild, adopting a puppy, a wedding. Okay, so getting a doctorate, I will, I can attest to that. I'm actually in my doctoral process. Uh, okay, so here's a, here's a great one. Eating homemade plum ice cream with relatives in Germany. So now if I asked Lisa, what time of day roughly would that memory happen? 4 p.m. That is very precise. And any smells associated with it? Coffee. Good. So if you take any of your memories and you think about them, it's you need three things. You need the sense of time, the sense of vision, and the sense of smell. So any of these memories that have popped up in the chat or any of them that you can think of, all of your memories that are housed in the hippocampus have to have those three things. Sense of time, sense of smell, and a sense of vision. And I say sense of, because people um, that are born that are, or have a, dis a blind, they're hard of hearing, they still have memories. So it's the sense of, right? So when you look at the whole limbic system, this is processing your amygdala, which is your fear and anxiety. And then your hippocampus, if you think of these as like file folders is, it's, it's saving these in that file folder. And just at the right time, the limbic system will say you're fear, uh, fearful of dogs. If you're walking down the street and you see a dog approaching on the other side, the limbic system kicks in because the hippocampus has formed that memory and it's able to um, kind of get your blood boiling a little bit and saying, okay, I need to be a little bit cautious because I you know, was bit by a dog or a dog scared me or whatever that, that, um, that memory is, right? It also works towards the good as well too. So this was really, um, when, I, when I went to this train the trainer for this brain development, this was one of the things that really kind of struck home to me. And the brain is a very intricate um, process system for us. And we also can suppress this within the limbic system. And this is why sometimes you will 
um, have an adult that will come forward and say, you know, they out of, you know, really no give or take that they um, recall a traumatic event that happened to them. And people will say, well, why didn't it, why didn't it come to them three years ago? Why, why did it come to them just now? It could have been something as simple as they were in um, a waiting office and a doctor's waiting office and someone walked by and they had the same cologne on or the same type of smell. And that smell was something that was almost not present from their memory and it triggered it. So there's all different, it could be the trigger of time, it could be the trigger of the sense of smell, or um, so that that is what could happen sometimes why um, how children will suppress and then for some unknown reason it comes out at a very different uh, whether they're an adult or whether they're an older child or um, it may it may never so that kind of explains some of the um, the memory part of your brain. So now, and I know you're probably going, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And that's fine. I will take plenty of questions at the end. Um, the cerebral cortex is the fourth part of the brain to develop. And it's the last part. And this is this processes your conscience, conscious experiences. So this is the part of your brain that processes your abilities, such as thinking, sensing, reasoning and other conscious actions. It's in the four to six outermost layers of the brain. And it includes folds and stuff that you'll see in most photographs and drawings. And it's the layer of the brain often referred to as the gray matter because of its color, but it, it's actually gray. I know on the slide it's pink, but this is you know coral color is because it's gray be in, in real life, it's gray because it lacks nerves and it lacks the insulation that makes the other parts appear to be white. So um, just so you know, in, in human form, that cerebral cortex is actually, um, it's actually sometimes referred to as gray matter, as you'll hear it. Okay, so those are the next slide, please. So those are the four parts of your brain that we just discussed. The brain stem is first, the cerebellum is second, the limbic system is third and the cerebral cortex is fourth. So now we have your basic survival, we have your muscle coordination, we have your emotions, and we have your thinking and processing. Now you can see, because we haven't discussed language yet, because language is very intricate and it doesn't occur in just one part of the brain, okay? It actually occurs in many, many different parts. So the next section that we're going to talk about are the hemispheres. So next slide, please. So we've all seen this picture, right? This is if you were standing on top and looking down at someone's brain and you kind of sectioned it in half, okay? Everyone's heard the left side of the brain controls the right side of the body. The right side of the brain controls the left side of the body, okay? There's so much more, right? So many of the functions that occur in the hemispheres occur in both of them, the left and the right. But the way each of the hemispheres approaches information is different, okay? So the, the right side of the brain, of the hemisphere, is responsible for the big picture. The left side is for specific details. Next slide, please. So the right side, as I said, controls big picture, overall general impressions, right? So I'll explain it to you like this. We're having a party. Everyone loves a party. Mostly everyone loves a party, right? And right brain walks into the party. And what they see is they see the big picture of what's happening. They see a, a new person that enters into the room. They see that the room is large, noisy, filled with people. So the right hemisphere is responsible for big picture orientation. It relies on symbols and images and it's concerned with spatial perception, right? 
So for people that are more right-brained, if you're thinking that right now, is you'll hear some people will say comments like, oh, they, they fly by the seat of their pants or they can't see the forest through the trees. Never really understood that one. Um, they, you'll like the Nike commercial, just do it, right? So that's that right brain, overall big picture, symbols and images, just do it, right? Now the left side of the brain, next slide, please. The left side is much more interested in the details. So again, we're having this party. Now, we wanna be kind and nice and we invite the left side to come. So now the left side enters the party, same party. And the left side is gonna notice a specific person. They're gonna say, oh, I see John on the other side of the room, right? They're gonna notice particular hors d'oeuvres being served. They're going to notice the location of the restroom. They're going to notice the silverware placement on the table, right? So the left hemisphere uses logic and details to process a situation. They use words, language, and objects to understand the world around them. It's based, their world is based on order and pattern. So the left, hem left hemisphere uses stra strategies and logic to make sense of their world. But for most people, the left and the right hemisphere work together to process information. Now, some people can have more right brain tendencies and some can have more left side. I'll give you a situation. So I, full time, I'm a program director for an early childhood school. Now, part-time, I do this. I do conferences, trainings, presentations, all kind of early childhood stuff, right? But it's a business. It's a consulting business, right? So I have to, on April 15th of every year, I have to do what? Who's going to be the first to remember? April 15th. Bingo, Ann. Taxes right? So I go to my accountant and I every year start out with my wonderful accordion organizer and I'm going to be good. I'm going to put my, um, my, you know, my meal receipts in here and I'm going to, I'm going to be, that lasts for about maybe three weeks, maybe a month. And then I get to my accountant and he starts talking, right? And he's saying, Cheryl, did you do, 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 do? And instantly I start hearing the Charlie Brown. Wah, 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 wah. Now I have to do it because I legally have to file taxes with the government, right? And then he'll say, okay, Cheryl, you know, it's this much money. Yep. Okay. Write a check. We're done. Yep. Good. Okay. He's like, you did not. Yeah. I said, no, I did not hear a word you said. My brain doesn't think in that specific detailed manner right that's that's cpa accountants those are very left-brained types now there's not a good side or a bad side but it's knowing which side you kind of tend to uh, tend to trend towards that will make your life a lot easier so i worked before i worked at um uh, the college, I Fisher College I work at now, I worked at a large childcare center and I wanted to start offering, you know, this great professional development calendar and we we're going to start offering college courses and this and that. I'm like, yes, great. I can see people graduating, walking across the stage, getting their, their diplomas and everything. Great. So I go to the owner of the company, my boss, and I say, this is what I want to do. So what do they ask for? Business plan, details, how much money, this and that. I'm like, no, 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 no. I can see it in my head. It's working. We just got to do it. Right. So I know if I want her to do anything for me, I have to go to her with details and specifics. And when she comes to me with something, she can have the best laid plan. I need to just tell her, like, I just, I just need a couple sentences of what you want me to do. And then I can take off, take off running and I can get it done. Right. 
So it's, it's realizing kind of which side you kind of prefer more. And also, next slide, please. This was extremely, this is, this might be hopefully an aha moment for a lot of you, is this band of fibers that runs between the left and the right hemisphere is called the corpus callosum. And this connects the left side to the right side, okay? So the corpus callosum, it's a band of fibers in the cerebral cortex that connects the two hemispheres together. The band of fibers enables the right and the left side to communicate and to share information, okay? So like I said, I tend to be more right-brained, right side, right hemisphere, but I can do left side tasks. It's not my favorite thing in the world to do, but I can do them, right? So the corpus callosum, it's present at birth, but as the brain develops, the hemispheres become increasingly specialized and the corpus callosum becomes more effective and efficient in processing that communication between the two sides. Now, this is the key point. The corpus callosum continues to mature during middle childhood. And one key element that's coordinated re related to the development of the corpus callosum is reaction time, okay? So the length of time that, th we're talking about the length of time it takes to respond to a stimuli. So once it's mature, right, which it, it's about early, early, early adolescence is when it's mature, right? So once the corpus callosum is matured, that reaction time changes, okay? So beginning about age 20, reaction time gradually starts to slow down again. And beginning older adults around 60 to 81, are about as quick in their responses as an eight-year-old, okay? So I want you to think about that because this has some implications, right? Now, again, I'm not having you, I don't want you to go back and diagnose all, you know, all the children, but you may have some children that like to sit for longer periods of time and do small detail puzzles, manipulatives, those type of things. You might have children that are more right-sided that like to do more big body movement, gross motor, outdoor play, more of that. And it doesn't necessarily mean, this is where there can be some kind of premature diagnoses, right? Because both sides, it's not, they're not fully specialized yet, and they're not fully communicating with each side, right? So now I'll give you another example. It's a game show, Jeopardy, right? I'm sure we've all heard of it. Now, they don't have, they have senior week, or they have uh, college week, or they have high school week, or they have fifth grade week. There's a reason for that. And that's because of the way that this, the information gets processed. A child that is 13 is, or an adolescent that's 13 is going to process information much quicker than someone that's 70 or 80. We see this in video games and it's where um, you might have a grandparent playing a video game with a grandchild and generally the grandchild will win, okay? That's because of their reaction time, okay? This is why the DMV or RMV, whatever it is in, in your area, they start to look at reaction time of seniors for driving, okay? It's that ability to process that information. It comes into your brain and processes it. And then it goes to, you know, your muscles to be able to coordinate, to be able to stop or to realize that something's in the way. And, and it's, for, it's for a safety matter. It's not that the DMV doesn't like elderly people, right? It's basically, it's their reaction time. And we know this. So that corpus callosum is really, um, you'll see it when you, I'll give you another situation where you could be in, you know, you're outside on the, the playground and you go to throw, you have a preschooler that's got their arms open and you go to throw them a ball and the ball goes, they, they close their, their arms after the ball falls through. That's their reaction time. It's because it's not fully developed yet. 
it's why uh, Tom Brady, they keep saying he's at the peak of his time. He's the peak of his time because he's young. He's going past his, you know, his reaction time is slowing down. Well, he's an abnormally putting this falsehood. He's uh, he's still playing at peak performance, right? So it's um, those are just a couple of different scenarios where um, the left and the right side need to be able to communicate through this corpus callosum. All right. Now, next slide, please. So now we have the four lobes. So if you look at each hemisphere, the four lobes are identical, right? They're duplicated on each side. So the first lobe, next slide, please, is the frontal lobe. Now the frontal lobe is responsible for your higher order, higher order executive functioning. And it's not fully developed until about 25 to 30. Okay, so um, this kind of explains a lot, right? When you're in high school and they're like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And you're like, I don't know, I'm not, it's not even fully developed up there, right? So the frontal lobe, this is responsible, it's just behind the forehead, and it's responsible for your thinking, reasoning, planning, decision making, creativity, judgment, problem solving. It's all controlled here by the frontal lobes. And it also control, it contains several areas involved in the control of voluntary muscle movement, including those necessary for the production of speech and swallowing. Now there's one area, it's called BRCA, B-R-O-C-A. BRCA's area is located in the frontal lobe and this controls the spoken and written language. So if a child is, has damage to the, the area of BRCA within their frontal lobe, is this could help, this could prevent a child from producing language or can cause speech impediments such as slow and slurred words or words that are not formed properly. Okay, next slide, please. This is your temporal lobe. These on each side are located over the ears and the temporal lobe are responsible for the ability to hear and to process and use language. There's an area within the temporal lobe, such as the frontal lobe, called Wernicke, or Wernicke, it's W-E-R-N-I-C-K-E, and that's responsible for receptive language. So that Wernicke's area is a, plays a critical role in the ability to understand meaningful speech. So if a child has damage to this area, it can cause the loss of the ability to understand language and then when a person can speak clearly, but the words that they put together, they don't really make any sense, okay? So this is when um, it's vitally important that when children have um, ear infections, is that if they have multiple ones or they're going to keep having them, is that they will now put tubes in their ears at an earlier age because the importance of being able to hear language and hear sounds assists in the ability to produce language. So for a child that has severe ear infections and it's not um, recognized and it's not dealt with, is that child could end up with or have a speech uh, delay because they're not hearing language the same way as everyone else that doesn't you know, have the ear infections. Now there's also something else that is delaying the development of language in children. And I'm going to let you guess what that is. It's something that we give to children that it has been consistently shown to children are developing language later than what they traditionally have been. So if you want to give it a shot, there's no, well, there is, there's, um, there's the right answer I'm looking for. But if you want to put the answer in the chat box, I'll let you know. What do you think that thing is that we give to children that could potentially delay language. Technology, sugar, technology. Nope. Close. Television, pacifier. I'm going to give it to you. It's the sippy cup. 
So when we look at the, oh, so that was the aha moment. All right. Shut the front door. I got it. All right. Woohoo. My day has now been made. So when you think about, you need to develop oral muscles in your mouth to be able to produce language. And when you have a sippy cup, you're doing that suck, swallow, suck, swallow. So, and children now are staying on sippy cups much longer than what they're used to because even car seats have sippy cup holders in them, okay? My first car didn't even, I'm gonna date myself right now besides this lovely gray hair, but is my first car didn't even have cup holders. I had to buy one of those little things that like, um, like the Christmas tree shop that you hang on the window and you're scared to death, the cups, you go over a bump and you're gonna wear whatever is in the, in the cup holder because it doesn't hold it steady, right? So children are now given sippy cups until much longer than what is developmentally appropriate, okay? Children need to learn how to take a cup, put it to their lips, take the appropriate amount of liquid and swallow. That is helping to develop the oral muscles that they need to produce language. So the sooner you can wean children off of sippy cups, the better off you'll be to be able to um, develop. And I learned this from a speech pathologist that used to come into an early head start that was suggesting um, a girl had very low uh, muscle tone in her mouth and would drool when she would drink out of a cup because she didn't have the oral muscles to um, keep the liquid in her mouth. So um, I, ca I can't give you a magic age, but you just, you want to try to start introducing um, uh, a cup to a traditional cup with just smaller amounts of liquid in it to, um, to children at an earlier age. Okay, now, uh, next slide, please. Um, so I'll address straws are the same thing because it's that suck swallow. So you want to be able to take that, the liquid from a cup at your lips and be able to swallow it. Just a straw is a sippy cup without that little stopper thing in it. And children will learn the same thing with straws as how to dump it over. Now, the only, the caveat I'll say is that, um, uh, is that you, children with disabilities, obviously if they have to have a device like that, then that's fine. Um, uh, sippy cup for a water bottle. You want a water bottle, as long as it doesn't have that pressurized system where you have to suck to swallow where they can just free pour the water into their mouth if they have to suck on it they need it's still doing the same thing as a sippy cup um great on using the regular cups in the two-year-old classroom you're gonna have spills all right so the third lobe is the parietal lobe so the parietal lobe is located at the crown of your head and this is responsible for touch smell and taste okay it's uh responsible for pain taste sensation spatial perception and body orientation this is the part of the brain that will help you to learn left from right okay and damage to the parietal lobe can actually prevent a child from un from realizing left from right right so it will also, if there's damage to this parietal lobe, impairment of writing and calculation abilities, difficulty recognizing body parts, and difficulty with spatial perception and the inability to draw simple figures. You guys do this every day. You see children, how they develop from drawing just a circle to adding the body to being stick figures, to drawing fingers and hands and, and earrings and hair. So you naturally see the progression of a child's drawing and mechanical abilities, right? You play, you play Simon Says with them, left from right, right? You, you do all sorts of natural games that we have played for many years that actually, actually will strengthen the parietal lobe without realizing that you're strengthening it, right? And I just want to say one thing. Uh, well, I said I'm a long, saying a lot of things in the hour, but is many years ago, 
we became a touchless society, right? Don't hug children, don't touch children. Um, we started carrying them in buckets, cold, hard plastic buckets, right? Now we take those buckets in the morning, we put the baby them, and you know what I'm talking about, the little infant carriers, right? We put those children in those buckets and then we put them, we click them into a cart or we click them into a carriage or we click them into a base. And then we click them out and we put them back in the other base in the car or we bring them into the childcare center and we hand them off. And we've never once held our child in that whole episode or environment, right? Children need to be held. I'm gonna give you the saying, and if I ever see you out or I see you in another training, you would make my day if you repeated it to me. Milk spoils, babies don't. I'll say that again for the people in the back. Milk spoils, babies don't. Babies do not have the ability, the cognitive ability to be spoiled, okay? They can be insecurely attached. They can be have avoidant attachment issues, but you cannot spoil a baby from carrying them. Look at other cultures. There's cultures that carry their infants for many years, right? There's cultures that carry their children and go to, and go to work all day, right? Milk spoils, babies don't, okay? And anyone, you can tell them I told you that, right? So in this parietal lobe is you wanna make sure that you're holding babies. Get them out of those devices, right? They need to feel touch. As long as it's appropriate, healthy, best practice, touch, right? Without touch, it's been shown that people, children, it, it, they lack the ability to make those strong connections that are vital for children's healthy development. Okay, and their emotional connections. So the last lobe, the next slide, please, is the occipital. So this occipital lobe, it's located in the back of your head. And the occipital lobe is responsible for processing visual information. Okay, not only does it allow us to uh, see and identify objects, but this, all, this lobe also allows us to see colors and interpret that each color is dif different. Now, vision for children in the begin when they're first born, they can only see in contrast colors, black, white, red. That's why everyone, all the toys, whatever. So it doesn't really matter what color you paint your nursery because children are born kind of, they can only see contrasting colors. So save your money. Now, the other, as children grow, they, they're, vision becomes more acute. So it's right around two to four months that it peaks. And then around the third month, the, there's about 15 neurons that are connected for the occipital lobe. So now the important number I want you to remember is you need to make sure that you pick up on any deficits by the age of two, okay? Because after the age of two, it's very difficult to have those repaired. If you can pick up on any um, visual delays or deficits prior to that age, they can try to go in and make corrections. There's a really good web um, a video put out by, series put out by PBS, and I believe it's called The, um, the Brain is Wider Than the Sky. And there's, there's a great experiment, there's a great um, section on that in the beginning on brain development and they actually do an experiment on a child that has um i won't give it all away but it's it's on i used to dating myself again i used to rent it from the library um but those that place that used to house lots of books um but they actually have it on the pbs uh website now that you can and if you forget it just shoot me an email and i'm more than happy to uh to share the link with you but the the other thing about the occipital lobe is it helps to interpret and distinguish shapes so without the occipital lobe, the brain would lack the capacity to distinguish between objects like circles, squares, and triangles. Now, I'll tell you something. This is very difficult for children that cannot recognize shapes. It makes learning the alphabet more difficult because think about it, what's the letter A? It's a triangle. The letter B? circles, straight line, letter C, half a circle. So if children, instead of teaching children the alphabet first, 
is you want to make sure that they're able to recognize and draw their shapes because our alphabet is actually built based on our um, set of shapes that we have. Next slide, please. And those are the four lobes, the temporal lobe, the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, and the occipital lobe. And like I said, they're both present on each side of the hemisphere, but then based on, so they overall are the functions what I gave you, but then within each hemisphere, they have those, whether it's big picture or detail oriented. And the next slide. So this is just a uh, kind of a last slide to kind of wrap everything up and it's impressions arriving at the brain make it enter take make it enter into activity just as food falling onto the stomach excites it to a more abundant secretion of gastric juices. So I know this was a lot of information in a short period of time but hopefully it kind of sparked some interest about the importance of when you're working with children is really getting in there to know what they know and what part of the brain is responsible. This was a training put out of, um, it's out of Atlanta, Georgia, and it's called Better Brains for Baby Training Initiative. You can still send people, uh, representatives down there to be um, a train the trainer. It was uh, probably one of the most profound things I've done in my career because I'm an absolute um, infant toddler love. So um, I, I hope it kind of sparks some interest. And like I said, I'm, I'm always up uh, to, to talk about babies and give anyone more information. If you, um, we might be close on time, but if you want to shoot me any questions or let me know. I'm on break right now, so. <laughs> Cheryl, that was awesome. Why don't you go ahead and share your um, email address in the chat if you do want people to be able to get a hold of you? Is that okay? Yep, great. Perfect. Take I'm going to stop the recording.